Okay, so I think we have a pretty good handle on simplification and representation of functions in different ways. Uh, we're going to take a step back and look at a little bit of theory, uh, and this will allow us to represent our functions in a couple of standard ways. Uh, these standard methods uh, will allow us to compare two functions together for equality, for one thing, but it'll also give us a couple of extra tricks to guarantee that we can make the simplest version. It'll seem a little counterintuitive at first because the version that we're looking at will in fact be uh, less simple than we start, uh, but you'll see as we go how useful these kind of representations will be. So the first bit of theory is um, that we're going to take any given function and we're going to represent it in min terms or max terms. What are they? Well, a min term is a product term. And again, when we talk about product and sum, we're not talking about multiplication or addition. We're talking about and and or. And it is a useful shorthand to use um, multiplication to represent and and addition to represent or. Some of the things translate, some don't, as we've seen in the past. Uh, but this addition sign is or, this multiplication sign is and. So min term is a product term with exactly one literal for every variable in the function. So if a function has three variables, function of a, b, and c, then a min term is going to be a term that has exactly one instance of a, b, and c in it. And you can think about how many of those there would be for any given number of variables. If a function has three variables, there will be eight min terms. If a function has four variables, there would be 16 possible min terms because any combination of the variable appearing as positive or inverted, complemented, will give you exactly the same sort of binary encoding that we've been looking at to represent all possible inputs to that function. And this is the point of min term max term theory is to allow us to represent all possible inputs, in, all possible inputs to the function in the function itself you know, in a form that we can write it out as. And we'll see how that works in a minute. So min terms then are a product term with one literal for every variable. And a max term is basically the opposite, the inverse. It's an or term, a sum term with one literal for every variable. A product term like this is going to be true if each of these individual literals is true. So this one here, for example, will be true only if a is false, b is true, and c is true. And a max term, because it's or, will be false only if all the inputs are false. So this one will be false only if a is true, b, or only if a is false, b is true, and c is true. So this represents a single input combination that can be presented to the function. And whether the min term or the max term exists in the functional representation tells us whether that input combination will result in a 1 or a 0, as we'll see. So for two variables, it's simple to write these out. A and B are our two variables, and there are four possibilities. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And these are the min terms that correspond to that input combination. A prime, B prime will be true if A is 0 and B is 0. A, B will be true if A is 1 and B is 1. And so each of these represents a single possible input combination. We name these in order to have a shorthand to represent them. Min term, little m, and the number corresponds to the binary encoding of the input combination. So if for min term 0, 0, 0 is 0. 1, 1 is 3, right? 1, this is 2 to the 1 and 2 to the 0, if you can think about it that way. So 1, 1 is 3, and that's min term 3. And the max terms equivalently are named the same way. Max term 0 corresponds to the input combination a is 0, b is 0, that make this term 0. Min term 0 is the input combination that makes this one term 1. Uh, and max term 0 is the input combination that makes this term 0. And note how they're opposite of each other. And it makes sense if you think about it, because if you take min term 0 and you invert it, right? this is true if both of these are 0. This is false if both of these are 0. If you take this one and invert it, then it's true. This thing is true if both of these are 0. And De Morgan confirms that for us. And in general, the logical value of a min term is the opposite of the logical value of the corresponding max term. Okay, so min terms are fairly straightforward to name. All you have to do is look at the, um, the variables as they're listed, and the variables that are inverted count as 0, the variables that are not inverted count as 1, and that gives you the input combination that will make this term 1. If a is 0, 
then a prime is one, a prime b is one, and min term one is one, because this is the binary encoding for one. The max terms, a little bit more work, but not a lot more work. Uh, and again, you can see the same kind of thing. This is the situation where it will be zero with this input combination. So if a is one, uh, a prime becomes zero, a prime or b is zero, and we want this to be zero. So we, for, for max terms, the input combination is we treat the primes as one and the not primes as zero. That gives us the encoding for that max term. And again, it's this binary encoding that tells us the name of the max term. Let's take another example. Let's take a four input function. A function like, I mean, it doesn't matter what the function is. Uh, some function f equals a prime b c prime d. That's the entire function. Whatever. What min term is represented in this function? Well, there's only one min term that's represented in this function because it's the full min term. This is, if we, I didn't write it, but we can say this is a function of four variables. What min term is that? Well, if a is zero, then a prime is one. And again, we're looking for the single situation in which this term is one. B has to be one. All of them have to be one together. C prime, for C prime to be one, C should be zero. D should be one. So this is zero, one, zero, one. This is min term five. Okay, because zero, one, zero, one is the binary encoding for the number five. One, two, four, eight. One and four is five. So that's how we're going to name these min terms. And we can see that in larger scale. This is all of the min terms for three variables. And we've listed them all the way from zero up to seven. And this is why we list them in this order, so that we can see them, all possible input combinations, and we can see what min terms they correspond to. But we can make sure that we list a zero or a one for every possible input combination. The min terms then are listed here. And again, say for example, min term five, this corresponds to one, uh, one zero one is the input combination because one, zero becomes one, one makes this term one. And if you look carefully, all the other terms will be zero. And this is the, the, the great power of the, of the min term representation is it can show you in detail exactly what input combinations will result in a one and any that aren't there will result in a zero. Opposite being true for max terms. Again, if we look at max term five, if we put a one for a, that becomes zero, b is zero already, and c, the one becomes zero, 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 this is zero, all the rest of them have to be one. So that's the, um, the way that we represent this. So a canonical form, more terminology, a canonical form is where we take a function then, uh, of any representation, and convert it into a representation that only includes min terms. Or, alternatively, a relationship that only, in, uh, 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 a representation that only includes max terms. So there are two possible canonical forms, sum of min terms, and again, sum isn't exactly right because we're oring, not anding, but, or oring, not, ad, not adding, but it works in our representation. It's, it's a good shorthand. And product of max terms. Again, we're not multiplying, we're anding those max terms together, but it's a good shorthand for what we're doing. Each min term represents a single input combination that causes the function to be one, and any min terms that aren't in the canonical form will make the function zero. Equivalently, in a dual kind of a way, every max term in the, sum, in the product of max terms representation will cause the function to be zero. Any max term that isn't in the representation will cause the function to be one. Let me give you an example. Here's an example of a canonical form. Given a function x prime, y prime, or z, these are not min terms. We know they're not min terms because it is a function of three variables and neither of these terms has a literal for every variable. We have to take this setup and convert it into a situation where there is a literal for every variable. So we have to add the variable z into this first function. How do we do that? Well, we can't just tack a z onto it. We have to change it in such a way that the logical value doesn't change. So we take x prime, y prime, First thing we're going to do is we're going to and with one because that doesn't make any changes. Okay, here's x prime, y prime, and we can and with one because that doesn't change it at all. The next thing we can do is we can say x prime, y prime, 
anded with 1 is equivalent to anded with z or z prime. Because if z is true, z or z prime is true. If z prime is true, z or z prime is true. And this encompasses all possibilities. Either z is true or it isn't. And then we can take and distribute this to the rest of the term, and we have x prime, y prime, z, or we have x, <laughs> x prime, y prime, z prime. So these two min terms together are represented in this term, which isn't a min term. So that's what I've got in this example here, x prime, y prime, anded with z or z prime, and that becomes these two min terms. Z equivalently has to be expanded twice. X, X prime, Y, Y prime, both can be anded with Z without changing its value. So when you and with one, you don't change the value. And then we expand this all together out into four min terms. X, Y, Z, X, Y prime, Z, X prime, Y, Z, and X prime, Y prime, Z. That's these two, um, these two OR terms that are sort of expanded using FOIL, right? Front, outer, inner, and then last. Binomial expansion, as we remember learning in high school. Uh, and then we multiply all of those by Z, or AND them with Z, and we get these four terms. The next thing we notice is that we have this term twice. That's why it's colored purple. X prime, Y prime, Z, X prime, Y prime, Z. And the idempotent rule tells us we don't need two copies of any term. We can throw one away, and it's fine. So we throw one away and we get, and then we can also reorder them because we have a rule that says that. We reorder them in such a way uh, that the min terms that they represent are in numerical orders. That's min term zero, that one that comes from here. This one is min term one that comes from there. That's min term two that comes from here. This is min term, uh, sorry, min term three. That one's min term five that comes from here. And that one's min term seven, one, one, one. It, over time, you will learn to recognize based on the which um, which variables are in their original form or their inverted form, you'll begin to recognize what min term that corresponds to. It takes a bit of time to learn that, but it's not that hard to do. And then we can actually write those min terms out separately, right? This significantly more complicated logical function can be written out as min term zero or min term one or min term three or min term five or min term seven which can be then written out as a sum of, and again, this is a little bit of a misnomer because we're not adding or oring, but because we're using the plus sign, we might as well use the summation sign, a sum of these min terms, which again can be shortened to a sum of min terms 0, 1, 3, 5, and 7. Why are we doing this? Well, you'll see the utility of this uh, method a little bit later on as we introduce Carnot maps. Uh, but what we're doing is we're basically doing the opposite of simplification. We're taking a function, which is reasonably simple, and we're expanding it into the list of min terms. This becomes then a short form for the truth table of the function. If you think about the min terms listed in order, um, any min term that's listed here will have a 1 in the truth table. Anything that's not listed here will have a 0 in the truth table. And so this gives us yet another representation that is equivalent to the truth table, and the function, and the circuit, it's all the same information. And we read this as a sum of min terms 0, 1, 3, 5, and 7. Now equivalently, there's a product of max terms. As you might expect, it's done in this more or less the same way. We take this form and first we make it look like it is a product of some terms. So we add, we or x prime and z together, we or y prime and z together, and then we and those two terms together. We can do that because we actually take this and use the distribution rule in the OR format. This looks weird, and I would encourage you to take your time to convince yourself that this step is valid. This is distribution over OR instead of over AND, and it looks weird because we're not used to distributing multiplication over addition because we're used to multiplication having precedence over addition. In Boolean logic, OR and AND have the same precedence level, and that makes stuff like this possible, and it looks really weird. So take your time, look at this again, and say, yes, I believe that this is true. The Z is distributed into the X and Y terms, and the result is this. Then, just like in the sum of uh, min terms version, we can take and expand each of these terms. These are um, not max terms yet, because they don't have every variable in them. X prime or Z is missing a Y. So we can say X prime or 0 or y, 
or, or Z. That doesn't change anything, oring it with zero. And then we can take that zero and expand it to Y or y, or y and Y prime. Zero is equivalent to Y and Y prime because there's no situation where both Y and Y prime are true at the same time. So that doesn't change the logical value of this term, but it does insert a Y into there, which means we now have X and Y, X or Y or Z in that term. Now we can take and expand this X prime or Y, Y prime or Z is expanded again using distribution to X prime or Y or Z x prime or y prime or z, and we can do the same thing with this second term by adding uh, a zero and then x, x prime, and then distributing that, we get those two max terms. These are max terms now because they have a literal for every variable. Once again, we can recognize there's duplication, and uh, our idempotent rule says we can throw one of those away, and the result is a list of max terms. Each of these represents a situation where the function is guaranteed to be zero. And any max term that isn't listed tells you when the function will be one. So max terms, min terms, more or less opposite. And if you look, this is max term two, because this is zero, one, zero. This is max term four, one, zero, zero. And this is max term six, one, one, zero. And again, we can write it with this sort of shorthand, this pi symbol, capital pi means product. We're not really multiplying, but it's a nice convenient shorthand because we're using the same symbol for multiplication as for and. And we can say it's a product of max terms, 2, 4, and 6, which is equivalent to listing them like this. And again, it's more complicated than we started with, but it's a, pardon me, a standard format which allows us to have a quick representation of the truth table. So the truth table for this function is anywhere there's a max term, it's 0. Anywhere else, it's 1. And the astute among you will look at this and notice something about the product of max terms representation and the sum of min terms representation. And what you should notice is that they are opposite, which makes sense because the max terms say where it's zero, the min terms say where it's one. And those two things should be opposite. It should be one, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And in fact, we have a rule. We call this the duality of canonical forms. The sum of min terms is, is equivalent to a different product of max terms. And we can say, in general, the sum of a set of min terms is equal to the product of a set of a different set of max terms, such that the union of the, those two sets is all of the possible input combinations. And the intersection of those two sets is the empty set. There's no term that is both a min term and a max term in the same function. And between the min terms and the max terms, we have all possible input combinations, which makes sense because it has to be either a one min term or a zero max term. So that's the duality of canonical forms. And we can state that as a function expressed as a sum of min terms. That's a typo, should be min terms, not mid terms. My spelling check doesn't know what a min term is. Uh, a function expressed as a sum of min terms can also be expressed as the product of the opposite max terms given that you know how many variables are in the function, because that'll tell you what this n is, whether we go from 0 to 3, or 0 to 7, or 0 to 15, whatever. It's going to be from 0 to 1 less than the power of 2 corresponding to the number of variables in the function. Because min terms are where it's 1, and max terms are where it's 0. De Morgan's law also factors into this, because if we take the min uh, max terms, for example, and we invert it, if we invert the function that corresponds to the product of max terms, what we get is a function that corresponds to the sum of the same min terms. So the sum of min terms of a set A is equivalent to the opposite of the product of the max terms of the same set. And again, if you can, you can go through this derivation and say that the Morgan tells us this is true. If you take the product of max terms and invert it, it's the inversion of the max terms all anded together. And De Morgan says that's equivalent to the max terms opposites all ORed together, and the opposite of any max term is the equivalent min term. And so we have the sum of the same min terms opposite, which again makes sense because product max terms is where it's zero. If we take where it's zero and make it one, that's going to be the sum of min terms for the same function. And in general, the opposite of any individual max term is the equivalent min term. Right, because max term zero is false when a and b and c are all false, and min term zero is true when a and b and c are all false. Max terms and min terms. So in the next set of notes, we'll take a look at how we can go from 
a, uh, Mac, a, a canonical form, some of Mac's terms or product of min terms, into something a little bit more simple. But we know that we can take any function and go to a unique uh, canonical form, which means we can go to a set of min terms, which tells us exactly whether that function is equivalent to some other function, which would have the same set of min terms. And it also gives us a shorthand, which is kind of like a truth table for the function in logical format. The cool thing about this is that we will be able to then take those and use those to uh, follow a specific set of rules that will guarantee the simplest function for any given logical expression.